Great people is irrelevant. A very warm good evening to one and all present here. I, Nishi Saxena, on behalf of the whole external relations team of IFMR, welcome each and every one of you for today's panel discussion. Now, I take this opportunity to welcome the distinguished guests who have taken their time out from the busy schedule and have agreed to be speakers for today's panel discussion. We have Mr. Krishna Padharthi, the HR lead at Mondes International. He is an electrical engineer engineer from NIT Dugapu and he also has a gold medalist in the 2010 batch of XLRI. He has seven years of work experience including four years at Tata Steel. We also have Mr. Dinesh, the Assistant Human Resource Manager at Rising Star Mobile India Private Limited. He is an MBA graduate from Gate Institute of Technology, Tirupati, 2014 batch. He also has work experience from IBM for one year. Our two speakers Ms. Nagarajan from Hunter Douglas and Ms. Ms. Manjula from Kellogg's could not join us because of some health issues. Now, I welcome Mr. Anand Narayanan sir who has agreed to be the moderator for the event. I welcome all the participants.
between our neighbors. So we have the chocolate factory next and uh, there is an opportunity for us to uh, meet them, you know, the people who are managing them. And uh, here are the gentlemen who are managing, you know, uh, doing really wonderful things in HR, uh, you know, managing, or giving a livelihood to, uh, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, which is not available for certain people in the local community. So a lot of things you will get to know from uh, the actually, so I don't want to waste much time on that. The topic of today's workforce, again, uh, the today's workforce is actually sitting here. And um, I also, uh, we keep reading a lot of uh, uh, reports and researches about millennials and the coming generation and all. There was one report which says that, you know, especially in America, uh, the current qualified graduates who are ready to go for work uh, are actually reluctant to go to work but stay at home and play with their playstations. Okay, uh, there is one trend which is being noticed uh, in the US. So there are a lot of interesting things happening. Um, people expect uh, a new workforce joining, uh, you know, for the productive business uh, in the economy. So uh, they are different, the likes uh, and dislikes are different compared to the earlier generation and they're, they're much more, you know, empowered with information. Uh, with the other MOOCs and uh, so many other developments. Sometimes, you know, many people don't even need a university now. You know, there's no, probably next 10 years down the line, I won't have a job. So everything probably uh, will be available online. You know, like plug and play. Whenever I want, I can just plug for a module and get myself qualified. So a lot of demographic as well as technological changes we have been facing. So, uh, it's a timely, it's an interesting topic actually which we have chosen and I hope waiting to uh, listen lot from the three bright uh, HR minds uh, on the stage. Uh, I just wanted to uh, lighten up the situation, you know, leaving you on an anecdote which someone told me uh, when one uh, a new, brand new MBA grad joined in a company as a management trainee. You know, as HR, it was basically, you know, on day one you uh, take them for an induction round, take them around to different departments and, uh, you know, almost your whole first day would be wasted. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, introductions, you go and meet people, get introduced. So one uh, such day, one gentleman, uh, a young management trainee, went around the company. So finally, the HR person was leading him, left him in his cabin. So to rel relax for a while and probably we'll discuss later. And then this guy was so tired, you know, walking around the plant and all. Finally, so he wanted to have a coffee. So he just saw an intercom there, so he just picked up the receiver, plus the pantry number, and immediately said, I want uh, coffee immediately. So unfortunately, that call not didn't go to the pantry. It went to the chairman's cabin. <laughs> okay, the chairman took the phone, and chairman was angry. Here is someone who is suddenly calling me and asking for a coffee. So he got angry, and uh, the chairman asked, "You know to who you are talking to?" Actually, so this guy was actually feeling the panic. He said, "Sorry, sir, I don't know who it is." So I'm the chairman of the company. And he was shouting, and then our guy asked. Sir, do you know to who you are talking to? Chairman said, no. He said, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's uh, probably the tip of the iceberg, the kind of workforce, you know, the, the world view is different. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, be with you all to listen to the experts on the stage and to get to learn more. So I leave the stage back to Nishi so that uh, we can listen to all the experts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satyasa, for lighting the moment and for your insightful thoughts. Now I call upon Avantika to again give a brief discussion about the topic and invite them on. Uh, good evening. 
evening everybody the topic for today's panel discussion is the changing face of today's workforce here's a small briefing about the subject the current workforce is no longer homogeneous like that of past decades organizations <coughs> around the world continue to struggle to attract and retain the right right employees employee engagement continues to challenge even the most sophisticated of hr functions research has established that Organizations need a diverse workforce for innovation to flourish for business success. The crux lies in how organizations can make the new workforce dynamics work to their advantage. I would like Venkateshwar and Sir to elaborate on the topic for today's discussion and initiate the panel discussion. Good evening to all of you, evening, and uh, welcome to uh, this occasion. I'm extremely glad that uh, a topic of this kind is being brought up for discussion today at FMR. And I compliment the group of you for having thought of uh, a, su a subject like this, which uh, has always been intriguing everybody. It's not just today. I think this subject has been intriguing people all along. For the simple reason that it is not just now that the face of the workforce has changed. The face of workforce has been changing ever since workforce came into existence, ever since industrialization. I'm sure the workforce that I was part of when I was going through my first few years of employment suddenly gave way to a very different kind of workforce when I came to the, the midriff of my career. And it was something very different when I chose to move out of employment. So the change in the profile of workforce is something that's been constantly happening. And it has always been a challenge to organizations to deal with. At some point in time that I realized that organizations cope with change at two ends. Often we keep talking about the change in the marketplace, the change in the expectations of customers the change in the expectations of the stakeholders, out external stakeholders, and how do organizations need to re-engineer themselves to be able to deal with it. But I'm not too sure if we have given a very serious thought to the other challenge that exists, that always existed within the organization, the need for organizations to re-engineer their approaches to deal with changing phase of the workplace. How organizations done it, how many of them have done it, and how successful is a big question. But one thing is very clear, that if organizations are not going to be able to manage the change within, these organizations are not going to exist to be able, forget managing the externality, but even to face up the external. So on a topic like this, what we would look forward to from our practicing friends is to give us an insight about what this change that we are talking about really is. One part of the change is in terms of the, the, the physical profiles of people. The other one in terms of the qualifications and experiences and the knowledge level of people. And the third kind of profile is in terms of their aptitudes, dispositions, and the cultural bearings that they bring to the workplace. workplace. Whereas the first part of it is very clear, and I think all of us know about it. It's there for everybody to see. It's the second and more the third that does not easily be what size. I think that's where we would request our friends who have uh, accepted our invitation and been kind enough to come here to talk to us about what are these soft changes and how have organizations geared themselves up to deal with them, what challenges have they faced and how successfully they've been able to deal with those challenges. So they leave us this evening with substantial learning, not about knowing that the change has happened, but to know more about how the change has been Generally. Thank you so much. I now invite our speakers to 
render to us their thoughts and share with us their experiences. Thank you so much. Yeah, very good evening to all of you. Good evening. Yeah. So before I uh, start off, I just want to tell you, see, see the reality of changing in the workforce. Today I am standing before you. Just seven years back, I have passed out from college like you, and I am currently like uh, managing the workforce, the entire workforce at Sri City. I think this is an example of how the aspirations have changed, how we are changing to the reality of the marketplace. So, to just set the tone, I just want to leave you certain thoughts. Why should we have a changing workforce? As uh, uh, Sir has already told, it's not about physical profiles and it's not about uh, certain changes in qualification. It's more about which is inside, which is always there, the aspirations. So, it's like when you cater to the aspirations of the people at the right time and at the right uh, way, you will be able to get the best out of the people. So now most of the organizations are trying to work out to unleash the best in, ev in everyone. So that's how the organizations are uh, designing themselves in terms of infrastructure, in terms of culture, in terms of systems. So just to give you a perspective, today in the morning I completed a meeting in a virtually connecting with the entire region of Africa, Asia, uh, Australia and Middle East. So the changing workforce which you need to navigate across time zones, navigate across uh, countries, navigate across uh, what should I say, cultures, that's how we need to have the skill and talent set. And most importantly, today I want to tell more on uh, the topic, how did we change? Yes, things are changing, but as organizations, what did we do? Some of the aspects which are really startling today's workforce are the reach of technology. So the technology is one of the important things which every one of us is affected. It is irrespective of qualification and irrespective of background and irrespective of anything. So we have to be very conscious of how to use the technology to our advantage. To just give you a perspective, again, technology is being used in our companies to the fullest. As simple as uh, uh, WhatsApp to the training modules uh, in terms of online trainings, uh, the way where uh, you have an instructor somewhere else in a, some different time zone, different country and all of us coming together and completing that training. where we get the best. So it's about where you get the best, you reach, you can reach out there and you can have the uh, advantage of going there. So in most organizations, including us, so we are trying to see, we give the best to our best to the employees in terms of engagement principles, in terms of uh, engagement, we also have different uh, ways where we reach out to people make them aware key things are happening at the same time so information is being passed at the same time you have right information at your place you can immediately use that and use that for your advantage so the HPWS work systems so most of the organizations are talking about high performance work systems the high performance work systems is a key for the organizations in today's world why? The first principle of high performance work systems is you respect the capability of each and every one. So unless we respect the capability of each and every one, the person will not be able to give his best. So the first aspect is respect the capability of all the employees. So it is irrespective of their stature, it is irrespective of their whatever background or anything. Then what you need to have is you need to give the entire set of vision, complete understanding about where your company wants to go. So now nobody wants to just be at his place and continue doing some work and go at the end of the day. He's more interested in understanding 
how we am I impacting the company at the end of the day? That's more important for him. He would like to see the results. He would like to see him connected with them. Yeah, am I doing that? Yeah, am I helping that? So that's how the aspirations of workforces. So what we have in our companies is yeah, the advantage which we had, which I had during my and which is very personal to me is building the culture at Sri City, which is a self-managed team in the high performance work systems way. So what we ensured is people know the targets which they have, we how they achieve that. So giving them visibility about the confidence about how they will be able to achieve it. Giving them all the trainings, giving them all the necessary inputs through trainings from different areas across. And the other important aspect which will really help is the contribution based progression system. Nobody wants to stick to a certain uh, certain grade for a certain period of time. Now it all have changed. It's more about fluid. You get skills, you contribute it, then you go ahead. You go ahead. That's how the companies are. So we have different uh, different ways where we gather the inputs about the people, where we gauge the inputs in terms of performance and give them the best. The best people will get the in terms of uh, the movement, the movement across the different skill blocks and they will ensure that they are being given the right inputs at the right time so that they will be able to give their best. So the skill and, contrib skill and contribution based progression systems, this is the important aspect of today's uh, organizations and proper information systems. We need to have proper information systems where uh, as small as certain thing where the particular in the entire uh, company, where they will be able to get that component. You won't believe, recently one of our operator was able to save at least 20 crore rupees. He is like uh, just a few years back, he was a 12th standard pass out student. He has come and he has come up with a beautiful uh, improvement initiative. So what he has done, very simple. So we used to have some, uh, in the chocolate wrapper, we used to have one small uh, element where we used to procure import it but however now he has found a vendor in some remote part of uh, Rajasthan where he could easily find him and he came to us and said Ki, we have this why are we not using it which is of the same quality that's all it's not about you have spent some 30 years in the organization or you have spent 20 years in the organization Yes, we need to have experienced people who will guide us in the right way. Uh, but it is irrespective of that, you can get ideas, you can get inputs, you can get improvement ideas. So that's what we are unleashing the potential of the people to the fullest, giving them the right culture and the right environment. That's how the organizations are dealing. Another important aspect what we have is the diversity. Diversity in terms of experience, diversity in terms of age, Diversity in terms of industry and diversity in terms of sex. All these elements will form an important part of the today's workforce. Because we need to have different ideas. Things are changing fast. We need to be able to cater to different customer needs, different customer aspirations. And we need to be agile, dynamic. We can't be doing the same thing again. So if you can see, we had a lot of innovations in the chocolate. So we had aerated chocolate. We had a chocolate which was like uh, with gems, candies, popping candy and all. So a lot of innovations being happening where it's only because we are getting close to the customer, understanding the customer better. So you understand the customer better, you will be able to deliver the right results. Keeping customer in focus, keeping customer at the center, every one of us will be. That's how the organizations are working. And for that, we need to have a mindset which is which is as simple as a customer mindset. What does a customer want? Customer wants the right quality, the right product at the right price. And that's what the organizations are trying to go for. That's where the organizations are going. Uh, the destination is that. So, I would say a, a new term, and I think that's a terminology which is like uh, already in vogue maybe, the HR engineering. So how do you use the different uh, things which are there in your hand and which are there with you and how do you engineer itself to your people. That's where 
uh, the new terminology I think will definitely be a very big uh, thing in the next few years and which will definitely help all of us reach our more ambitions and more aspirational targets. Yeah, without taking much time, thank you for uh, your cooperation and thank you for hearing me out. So, I was just sharing with sir, so this is the first time I am coming here. So, I was always there, sitting that side and like hearing people out. So, thanks for giving IFMR, but thanks for giving me this opportunity. It's uh, definitely, a, uh, I believe it's a proud moment for us. And thank you very much. Thank you. Very good evening to all of them. Myself, Dinesh, uh, working as assistant HR from Rising Stars Mobile India Private Limited, where around 11,000 employees are working. Out of 11,000 employees, the 90% of the employees are women. So we should be proud. <laughs> I don't know whether it's uh, like uh, I, I should feel proud to be here with you. Or, uh, and I should say thanks to my manager, Mr. Sai Prasad, uh, because uh, he has committed it to talk here, but uh, due to some things, uh, he need to go out on official work. So I don't want to take much time. I'll just say a few words about the uh, changing workforce in India. Uh, the first point is uh, India will have the youngest workforce by 2020. So having the youngest workforce by 2020 is one kind of advantage for all the organizations to have the best and young talent in the organizations. The second one is the women workforce is uh, high uh, ever before. The women workforce, the women are being employed in the organizations hugely. So it is one kind of change that is happening. The one thing that I want to say about the change in workforce is the change is must for everyone, whether it is organization, whether it is employee. So, uh, when we take an example of Nokia, so some years back, the Nokia has ruled the world with their products, but they were uh, hesitant to change their products. They have been introduced the new one, uh, Windows. They have, uh, they were not able to change their products according to the customer needs. If they would have uh, used the Android version, they might have been succeeded, but they were done with the different versions, so they have been failed. Thanks for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Is there anybody who wants to join in and say something on the subject? Or do we ask you questions now? Yeah, you can also say what you want to say and then ask questions also. Asking questions is an interesting thing, but you can also share your thoughts if you have any. Any fun, colleague here, or share your thoughts on the subject. Would you like yeah, please, thanks. Okay. I used to work for FSS uh, till recently, uh, after completing about 30 years of experience in human resource function, 
in 10 different country, co companies. I left them. I started out with Vekatai Swaran. He was the one who hired me first. <laughs> 30 years back, 1986. And, uh, and what I did was, uh, perhaps, knowingly, unknowingly, I was trying to imitate him. To the extent, you know, when Mr. Venkatesh came to my office, you know, when I was in the FSS, he came to meet us regarding some training as in my And I, I was having a couple of my managers with me, one Chennai and one uh, uh, in Mumbai on phone. He had the meeting with us and he left. Immediately after us, both of them, they asked me, Ravi, this man is trying to imitate you. He is almost aping you. I told them, he is not the one who is aping. You know? <laughs> 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 it was like that. So it's, it's a great honor for me to be here. But I must tell you, I come here completely unprepared for this challenge <laughs> to talk about workforce. But one thing I can talk about is the changing face of people in general, which also includes work, man, uh, work force. When I started off, we were, uh, you know, I started off when I was uh, um, uh, 21, 22. We belonged to one generation. We call that Generation X, isn't it? That is the generation your parents belong to. Now, this generation of workforce we are talking about is Generation Y. This is the generation of my children and you people. How much it has changed, you know it for sure. How it is the way your father reacted to the world vis a vis you reacted to your this world, or perhaps of your father reacted to the, his father vis a vis you react to your father. There is a whole lot of change. You know, I have, you know, I look at my father as the person who knew everything. My son doesn't think like that. I have never talked back to my father at all till he passed away. Not once I have spoken back. My son even, couple of days back, he told me it's none of your business. <laughs> you know, we used to have a chair where my father used to sit, you know. It's a cane, easy chair kind of a thing. He used to sit there, that was considered to be his chair. I have never sat in that chair. Now he is gone, even now the chair is there, I don't sit there in my village. But my children could sit there all the time. This Gen X and Gen Y so much has changed. But the point is, this is not one shift. There could have been perhaps 10 shifts in between, phases of this shift. They are different people, obviously. I have seen many of them, and I have seen uh, at various age group and various uh, segments of industry, manufacturing and IT, largely IT, subsequently. It changed and it's constantly changing. Now, the ones who are born after uh, 2000, are they in your employment? It's not possible, no? Yeah, okay. After two years, they will come. They will behave completely differently. You know, it's worse than my son, he, they will behave, by the way. <laughs> right? And uh, it's for it to manage. 
I have, you know, I don't know, maybe I will abruptly end now here. I have a right to abruptly end because I didn't prepare, you know. Before I put my foot in the foot in my mouth, I stop here. Thank you so much for the seat. inside the company and after that what company gives so if both the expectations and what is there both have to match so that's where the marriage is unfortunately during my experience of working uh, two different companies what I find is uh, being, being in the colleges being in the most premier institutes like you so there is a lot of expectation built in and there is also a lot of, uh, you don't have your own opinion, let me tell you, it, it was even me. So I had somebody else will be influencers because you are all here together. You don't know what you really want. So believe me, in spite of uh, we getting the best of information, best of things, we are sometimes not kind to ourselves. We don't know exactly what we want. And what we generally uh, aspire for will not match what we want. And when you sit for the different uh, jobs, that will again go for a toss. So finally you land up at somewhere considering different elements without considering what you want. So that's one. And finally you come to the company and expect a lot of things to happen. Yes, companies have systems to manage this particular difficulty. Because most campus placements are managed by uh, managed by uh, just passed out employees and they are very conscious of this fact. So that's the reason companies rotate people to different functions. And in most companies, especially in Cadbury's or Wondley's, after giving a choice to the person to move across, because we know he has not taken the correct choice when he has opted for our job. And finally we asked him, at the end of his tenure, we asked him, are you really, uh, you feel, did you, do you feel you have made the right choice? And if he feels, yes, you have made the right choice for joining in a company like us, then we will again ask him, which function do you like to work in? So even function, see, uh, it's only the skill sets which we require, it's only the competencies which we require, the learning agility is what is required, the way we uh, see things, the, what should it be? Analytical skills are more required and of course the communication skills and all the uh, hygiene factors now. So once you get to understand after migrating to different projects, then you will be given a choice where you want to move in and you will be given that particular placement. That's where we want to reduce the amount of disturbance and noise which generally comes into the system. So we can't reduce the noise. In fact, we do the best interviewing practices and we know how to fake it. So that's the difficult part. You go to the best assessment centers, 
you go to the best competency measures, do one day complete workshop of assessment and yeah, so that one day won't really help. And one more important thing which is really helping us is the summer placements. So most of the intake nowadays is through summer placements. It's like you watch for three months and I watch for three months. If both of us are happy about that, then we will go continue together after the end of one year. So these are some of the systems which companies are trying to bring in and to mitigate the losses. Yeah, I hope I have answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the discussion. Uh, this question is not in specific to anybody in the panel, uh, but this is uh, particularly from the HR point of view. Uh, it's always I've realized and witnessed that over the past uh, change in times, uh, the, the increase in uh, importance of work-life balance has been enormous uh, amongst the workforce. And the Facebooks and the Googles of the world have been uh, constantly raising their standards in terms of uh, helping the, the employees have uh, a very peaceful work-life balance and uh, a very friendly and fancy environment to work in. So while that is happening on that side of the world, uh, how, how difficult does it become uh, for the companies in that league to actually match up to those standards and make sure that their employees are as equally happy as that of the Facebooks and the Googles? So, uh, I will talk in, I uh, will give you specific uh, answers and practices which we are following in our companies. And of course, it's a very difficult uh, question uh, to find the right balance. Now, it's the employee who has to take a call finally. So, companies can only give you options. So, the work-life balance, the first thing is you, uh, of course, we give the best of atmosphere in terms of the environment where you can it's an open office culture and you have places to recreate yourself and re-energize re yourself. Uh, this is like particularly the different age groups which we target. So the age groups of just outside the college they want, uh, which is very, as you have rightly said, Google type offices. So what we really want to give is like open space where you can go and talk with your boss. So he's just sitting next to you and you can go and talk with you. And where you can, um, uh, get your, uh, see there are library, everything is there within our offices. Now, the important aspect of work-life balance, uh, I would accept it's a difficult question which even our company is facing to give because it finally depends on the employee. How efficiently is making himself capable enough to complete the job within that point of time. So it a lot depends on the employee himself. Companies can give you a lot of opportunities to skill yourself, to get there. But unfortunately, it so happens that the employee feels the organization is not giving me much time. Organization is not giving me much time. Without realizing, it's half of the battle is he has to win for himself. He has to reskill himself. He, once he reskills himself, he will be able to get a lot of things very easily. Instead of, uh, you need to reach out to people, you need to network, you need to network with people, you need to use the technology to your advantage, and you need to complete whatever you have with all the resources you have. You can't be a single individual player, you have to work with a team where you can. Of course, companies inside would try to give you all the options to complete your work within very fast, very innovatively, and very creatively. And the regular practices are anywhere there. You can work from your home. You can work from your home. You can take some time break off. Paternity leave. A lot of, uh, lot of leaves, a lot of leave concepts, a lot of work from home. So different things are anywhere given. But in spite of all this, it's finally employees, we ourselves, it's there in our hands. That's how I look at this. I will just add something. Uh, so this is more in terms of uh, Clearing up perception. So when you talk about uh, work life balance, one thing I think we need to understand is there cannot be a universal model of ensuring work life balance. 
businesses have their own special characteristics. And a model that applies to one business and hence to an organization in that sector is not necessarily transferable to another organization in another business. So the way I look at it is not so much in terms of the specific approaches and processes for ensuring work-life balance. But then the larger question is, within the boundaries of what we do and how we do in this business, are we providing enough scope for people, enough space for people? And the, the, the operating word for me here is space. And space is two-dimensional. Space physical and space, space emotional. Which means, am I creating a work environment where the, the forces that will cause stress are minimized and where I have an opportunity to work in a manner that I tend to enjoy, irrespective of what I do. So now, to create that space for both physically and emotionally, is that the objective? And of course, approaches have to be different in different organizations, in different businesses depending upon what fits into that business in the world. So this is a, this is a kind of a thought which I, I thought uh, you know, one need to hold because I see a lot of scenarios where people expect that something that is being pursued in one kind of organization, in one kind of business, be seen and available in another business, in another sector. All that I can say is it's an unrealistic expectation. But the realistic expectation is that of space in whatever we do. I'd just like to add to this point. Sorry. Since you raised the question of work life balance, I think it comes to something that you probably studied in your OB course as to what makes somebody want to come to office or come to work. Yeah? And uh, Firstly, this varies from person to person. You would have seen that very clearly. Right? Uh, so some people, you know, I have spent time with uh, at least uh, from batch 15 onwards, who actually tell me from the starting discussion, I said saying that I don't want to spend more than eight hours in the job, so tell me which sector should I go and apply to. Right? Uh, and they're not even clear which sector they want to go to. So it's just like saying that to me the work-life balance is very, very important. It's like Work is something that is necessary to earn a living so that I can have a life. Okay? This is broadly the uh, thinking that's happened across the US and when Americans come to India they constantly are surprised by the commit commitment they see in Indian employees. They are very surprised. Like, how is this possible? You know, because we spend all our time here working because we have to, not because we want to. Yeah? And uh, the, the primary thing in life for them is Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Monday to Thursday is necessary even. This is one way of looking at life. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. Okay? Uh, so you will have this uh, variation. At the other end, you will have also people who's, you know, who are working uh, because of very strong personal motivation. To give you an example, you all know the person called Sasikala. Right? Everybody is shocked about how she managed to stage this coup and take over the party or whatever. Right? But what you must understand with, and some of you must bear with me for making this comment, Jayalalitha was always a very unpleasant person to deal with. Extremely interpersonally unpleasant. Nobody could survive living with her all the time. That's why she managed to antagonize everybody, including the best of IAS and IBS officers. Nobody can stand her constantly. Very difficult. So somebody managed to stay with her continuously saying that I will take all this pain because I know at the end of it I am going to get something. And I am telling you this because this is a very visible example but there are people like this in every organization who are willing to take a lot of bad treatment you can call it because they are very clear this is going to lead me somewhere. They will even take the pain. Right? They will spend time in the office just because boss is, boss is in the office, not because they have work to do. Boss is there, just that boss is there, I will stay in the office. 
They do that. You know, they take a lot of pain, they hang around there literally because they know at the end of the day with all this unpleasantness, one by one people will leave. And whoever stays behind, then becomes a the next boss. Right? So ask yourself, you know, work-life balance is important. I'm not saying no, but ask yourself, what is draining you? Yeah? So if you're, if you're saying life is important, work is a necessary evil, that's one perspective. The other perspective is my ambition is important, everything else is irrelevant, that's another perspective. Right? The third perspective is, I've seen people who come to office and ask them, they say that, I have done my work. You know, so they have what is called in OB language, transactional commitment. They are committed to saying, I am supposed to do this, I have done it, pass. What should I do more than this? That's one way of looking at work. So if that is your way, then no problem. You have plenty of work-life balance. Then the one more category is there. People who are driven purely by passion. They will do what they think is supposed to be done, whether the organization values it or not. Right? Sometimes the organization may say, don't do it, they still do it, because they believe in it. They become unpopular for a short time, but ultimately their passion takes them wherever they want to go. But they're just driven by passion. That's another category. So you want to ask yourself, which category are you in, where are you working, and on that basis, decide what kind of work-life balance you want. And finally, this changes for you from time to time. When you are young, not yet married, you have one key equation. The moment you get married, your equation changes. The moment you have kids, the equation changes further. When kids grow up, you get teenage children, again it changes. Right? At every stage, your equation keeps changing. Yeah? Uh, I address this question to Mr. Krishna. Uh, sir, you have been in uh, Tata and now in Mondelez. So, what are the challenges you faced from uh, Tata and, and now in Mondelez? Please address it. Tata is a, of course, uh, I consider it very near my heart. So, that company is like great in. Uh, the way they uh, have their uh, different ecosystem in place. They have a complete ecosystem. You never feel you are lost in that company. You have everything, you have supports, you have the great Star Wars there. Okay? The one thing which I find uh, starkingly different between Tata and the US MNCs is, uh, as Sir has rightly pointed out, the passion. So here, uh, what should I say is, uh, in Tata, you will not be, of course you will be, you will be given the um, things and all, but uh, you have a lot of people there, you have a lot of people there, and if you want to do something, you need to go to different people, you need to go and take necessary opinions, take necessary things and all. So, that's the way of working at, it's a different uh, way of working there, and which has really worked wonders for them. But in a US MNC it's completely different, it's true. They tell you, you have to be passionate about your job, that's it. That's the only thing which they take, complete, and you are given the entire go. So whatever you feel, you get it going, and of course you take the top level uh, commitment from the, you buy in the top level commitment from the team, saying you, whatever you are doing, whatever you are having the vision, is definitely, uh, what, uh, what are showing it, and you believe and you get it. That's how these companies work. And in these sort of companies, the added advantage which you get is the lean manpower. So once you unleash the best out of each and every person, each and every person goes the extra mile to conquer, uh, to conquer, and by giving, of course, the different. Uh, we only see a part of it. Of course, there's other part of it which the uh, complete environment is created for getting that passion out. Yeah, that's most important. Thank you. Hope I have it, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, this is a question for Krishna, sir. Uh, iPhone has few, means very few adjustments. And it's a concern for all of us. And since many of the new interns have the engineering background, so you being an engineer, so what made you choose HR? It's a kind of uh, Telling that why, uh, how engineering can be helpful in your HR career. Yeah, so as I have already talked about it, uh, yeah. So today, when I uh, 
I generally used to talk everything in the concept of uh, electrical at one point of time when I started doing my HR. So the potential I used to see is the potential of a person. The current is the passion. So how passionate you are, how passionate you unleash your potential. So capacitor, I see. So everything I used to relate it during my earlier days. And I am telling you so uh, being an engineer is both an advantage and a disadvantage. So you need to uh, leverage the advantage part and to subside the uh, disadvantages. See, the advantage is uh, if you are told something, you will do like that. Okay? And of course, you will try to get it. What is it? Who is an engineer? He uses limited resources to produce the best quality output. That's what I believe in. So, companies needs engineer now. You need to have the limited resources, whatever it is, time, people, infra, money, everything. And you need to get the best solution for that. And the disadvantage is, uh, <clears throat> what I can say is, uh, maybe we are not very uh, fast or dynamic. See, again, it's completely the person who is there. So it's not about what qualification you have. So generally it is perceived that the engineers are lacking a little bit of uh, creativity part, little bit of creativity part. So maybe you need to work more on that. That's it. Sir, yeah. uh, so more that. question, sir. Yeah. Sir, uh, as you said that technology is much needed in HR nowadays. So if a student is pursuing HR as a career, do you recommend uh, like any specific technology or certification? Sorry, I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but definitely, HR analytics is uh, HR analytics is gaining a lot of ground. And the big data, the big data is definitely a thing which uh, HR will unleash. And it's already people are unleashing the different patterns and the different uh, patterns which are emerging during the surveys and different things. So it's, the surveys are no more do some survey, do an average, and come with a result. No, that's not how it is. So you do a complete operational research. You have ANOVA, MANOVA, everything. So you do all that, you have the patterns out, attack that. So <clears throat> I don't know if uh, there is some certification for that, but data analytics is going to be a king in the king. Yeah. Yeah, I think we need to. Sir, sir, just two more. Sir. Yeah. Is there anybody want, want to ask a question? We can take one more. Just sir, one it's all short. Sir. Hello, Let, let's see how much time it takes. Then we'll take a call. Sir, so this to Mr. Dinesh. Uh, Look at Shree's needs home to many factories over here. Uh, so how do you find, and Shree's needs not a developed area as such, and how do you find capable people for uh, companies? Actually, uh, uh, to assemble mobile phones, we require the people who just did their SSC, intermediate and uh, graduation. We find that this is the right place who has, uh, uh, which has the most people, uh, uh, mo most workforce uh, who have done their SSC intermediate and uh, education from village backgrounds. So it actually suits you? Yes, it suits us because we have so many villages and so many people who just uh, dropped out their education till SSC and the day graduation due to so many yeah. reasons. When I go and start my company in Mumbai or Bangalore, somewhere else, I can't find people who just did their SSR intermediate. So I may need to pay more money. So it is the right place to have the uh, lower education people which suits for my work. Of course, uh, it is a little difficult uh, to retain the best of talent in the organization. Uh, we have all the staff category employees coming from the Chennai. Uh, they have uh, so many opportunities in Chennai. In spite of that, they are coming all the way to the Sri City and working here. Uh, that they know that uh, the value of rising stars. So the value of rising stars, the brand uh, 
uh, it enforces them to travel all together here and to work here. They feel working in RM SMIPL uh, is an uh, proud to them, feeling proud to work in RM SMIPL. So it's it's uh, Krishna? Yes. Same point for you. Or you have different view on this because. Your challenges are more complicated. Definitely it's a challenge. Definitely it's a challenge. And uh, especially having a 50% diversity as our uh, cornerstone, attracting diversity is more difficult for us. Um, what we are doing? Yeah, we are uh, getting, uh, in spite of, uh, we are okay with uh, having the position vacant for one to two months. So we will uh, put in extra efforts. The team here will put in extra efforts uh, to get the diversity. So we feel the diversity pulls in diversity. It's not like I can only be there and I can't be there. So diversity pulls in diversity. So I have to build diversity. So we are ready for that. Yeah. And believe me, uh, we need to create that right pull to show them what is there here. That's where the thing is. After that, the battle is won. Because once they see the culture here, they see the uh, way people are being taken care of, that will be there. Of course, it's a challenge for the working uh, mothers, so it's a challenge. Uh, Beginning a factory again, so we are also trying to find an innovative solution for that. So for females of uh, age group of 20 to 25, at least we have certain ways of coming out of it. But for a working mother, it's a challenge and uh, our organization perceives that. And we are trying to see how we can give them more work from home concepts on different things. Yeah, that's what it is. <clears throat> and I just want to continue Akash's uh, question. Yeah, there are other certifications which uh, generally Akash, right? Yeah. So other certifications, which is MBTA certifications, so which will add to your uh, CV. Yeah. Thank you, sir. SHR certification. I think there is a certain NHRD also yeah, runs some certifications. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think we need to. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think we have time for any further questions. Uh, I think we need to move on. Alright, now I request Mendy uh, Fiction Sir to come and conclude. I'm sorry, we don't uh, take any more questions. There's boundaries for everything, it's the boundary of fact. <laughs> so thank you very much for uh, having articulated a wide range of issues and reporting on the lectures that are raised here. My job is made easy in one way, a little complex in another. It's always good to start with what is complex. What is easy is easily understood. Well, see, a lot of things have been talked about in the last uh, one hour. A lot of questions, I think very, very interesting questions, I'm sure. If you had the time, you would have gone on because uh, looking at the kind of questions that we came and uh, no one definitely understood that uh, the questions were ranging. You know, they were not uh, just one issue, they were looking at multiple issues. But it's what, and probably that's what has the complexity too, because uh, the, the questions that you raised touched upon several aspects of uh, organization and people management. So it's very difficult to be focusing on a, a section of that to, and, and to come to a summation. Hence, I would go into the easy part of it, the comparatively easy part of it, of trying and summing up the core thoughts that emerged which are directly related to dealing with the changing phase of the workforce, which means the core theme of our discussion today. As I kept listening to what was being said, I could capture three or four major thoughts. And I, I, I'm happy that I could be here to share these because uh, for me, it is also an opportunity to reinforce some of the understandings that I myself have gained over a period of time through my interactions with different kinds of businesses and business organizations. 
one thing, what, what struck me first was about the changing face of the workforce and the new workforce that merged and emerged is uh, their need to be respected for their capability. I, I think one of, the, one of the important features of the workforce of today is a belief that we can. I think it's a great positive belief about myself, but not based on hope but based on a clear assessment of my capability. And because I am taking a view that I can based on my assessment of my capability, what is it that I look forward to? I look forward to a scenario where people tend to respect my capability. So respect for capability seems to be one of the core issues that engages the minds of people of the current generation workforce. And what are the kind of responses that organizations can come with to respect people for what they can do? Look at the human resource as a bundle of capabilities and not just a bundle of people. I always believe that nobody in any organization manages people, which is beyond the capability of anybody to manage people. But what you can manage is the thoughts of people and the capabilities. And I think that's what's emerging as an issue from this discussion. The second thing that I see, and I, I fully agree with what was said, is the desire to see the big picture. The desire to see the large picture, the large canvas to which I am contributing. I don't want to be seen as somebody who is performing a task. I don't want to be seen as somebody who is holding a job. But I want to be seen and I want me to see it myself how I am contributing to a larger purpose. Connecting to something bigger seems to be a hugely important agenda in the minds of the workforce of today. Which means organizations have this onerous responsibility of not just telling people what they have done and how well they have done but also presenting to people what their good work has impacted in the larger span of the organization and its business. Which means we need managers, we need leaders who can connect people's performance to larger organizational results. And it's not an easy challenge. The third issue that they saw was on the reward side. Not the days when we talked about reward me for the time I spend here, reward me for the efforts I put in, but reward me for what I can do and what I actually do. Which means organizational reward schemes and reward policies and reward processes probably needs to get tied to skills, competencies, and Thank you for using that word, contribution. <coughs> Finally, what I could pick up was an overriding interest, I would even call it a pension, a pension for newness. I'm sure you agree with me that I think it's a part of that. We get bored with something too soon. Well, it is okay to get bored, I don't want to comment on it. But the fact is that <coughs> one gets bored too soon. Which means our minds are always looking at something new, thinking about something new, looking at things differently, and doing something. What does it mean for organizations? It means a huge challenge to organizations in terms of building a culture. And what is that culture? It is the culture of innovation. Can organizations promote innovation not as a value-adding dimension of an organization, but as a fundamental dimension of an organization? The days are gone, I am I'm sure you'll agree, when innovative organizations tend to be on the forefront. 
today I think we have come to a stage where innovation is no more a plus factor. Innovation is a highly factor. So can organizations live up to this challenge of building innovation through giving what I talked about, space to people? So can organizations structure systems, processes, be built around the concept of giving space so that people can unleash their capabilities. Bottom line, I know I do need to close. Having said no more questions, I do need to close. I think the shift is very, very emphatic and clear. And I have seen it as a practicing manager. I have been seeing it, seeing it as a consultant and trainer. And I am also seeing it as a teacher. And what is that shift? The shift is from making the best of efforts to something else, which means the focus is no more on getting people to increase their efforts, because efforts are not going to lead anywhere. The focus is on improving, increasing, and utilizing the improved level of human capabilities. So can organizations build capabilities in people who think they can? Can organizations build competencies and capabilities in people who want to? Can organizations build capabilities in people who want to look at things differently to all? To my mind, those will be the success factors for the organizations, not only of the future, already of today. Thank you so much. That's why it is love. <laughs> I would like to call upon Mr. Satya Narayan sir to present a token of appreciation to Dinesh sir for being here with us today. Inside the hall, as well as the auxiliary hall, you know what? We, we had a, a you know small group meeting in the boardroom where I got to know a lot of practices. In fact, uh, what they are actually doing for the local community. In, in fact, both of both the companies and both these gentlemen are handling uh, you know people at the different levels of the skill pyramid. So, uh, so this, this is not, that's why I say it's not a 
a formal word of thanks, but I really thank you for taking uh, your time and being here and sharing many of your experiences uh, here, both to Mr. Krishna as well as perhaps to Dinesh, and uh, also to Mr. Nagarajan, uh, who was with us, unfortunately, he has to leave uh, due to some exigencies. And uh, my own travel partner, uh, was a recognition, sir, actually, uh, because we travel to, together to Chennai quite often where we keep sharing a lot of ideas. And uh, this is an amazing, uh, you know, HR uh, incisive views which he gave, he kind of summed up and gave it as an essence to us. And thanks for, thank you, sir, for taking time off and being here on an evening, especially. And I thank all my faculty colleagues who have been a great support. Uh, you know, right from the beginning in actually organizing this at every stage, you know, in, in fact, uh, especially uh, PTP chair and even rescheduling some of these sessions and also, uh, you know, that it calls for that kind of coordination to have an event of this kind uh, for you and uh, thank you all, especially, you know, uh, for being here, all the student friends, uh, you know, uh, to spend time and uh, asking a lot of pointed questions and some of the questions were really interesting, you know, that's also a part of our learning, you know, not all the time we stand on a pedestal and teach, there are also occasions where we learn from you guys. And thanks for being here and uh, I thank all the members of my own external uh, relations committee uh, who have been almost, uh, you know, every time when I, when, uh, you know, uh, Akash keep bothering me <laughs> on my room number six outside. I'm always scared seeing his face. <laughs> so for almost for the past uh, two weeks, he was handing me on you know various aspects of calling people, inviting guests, and all, uh, even designing all the backdrop to invitations. So so, so many work has uh, been done by the entire committee. All the members uh, chipped in with their own contributions. So it's an excellent teamwork, and I hope they should continue. And uh, you know we should start doing much more greater activities, a lot of value addition and learning. And uh, again, once for uh, once again, I thank you all for spending your evening here. Thank you very much. Thank you.